thank you, uh, Mr. Razdan, and thanks, uh, Dr. Kirk, for inviting me here for the session. And uh, I would say that this, as you rightly said, this is the hardest session towards the end of the evening of a Friday when people want to go and party, actually, before the weekend. Um, I would, um, I'm actually uh, representing also Long Duration Energy Storage Council. I had a presentation, but it's fine. Um, which I think only one person here from Bechtel spoke about long duration energy storage. Uh, and when we, I would limiting the discussion to smart grids or microgrids, I think we have seen enough of the presentation since morning that we are actually going to be integrated. The systems are going to be integrated. It's very difficult to disintegrate uh, EV system from a PV system from a short duration energy storage or a long duration energy storage. So for me, if I have to say what is a smart grid, I mean, I would say it's a flexible grid. A grid which is flexible enough to deliver net zero with the 24 by 7 renewable energy. For that, you need to have artificial intelligence, for that you need to have data analytics, for that you need to have systems, and energy management system, so that the grids work in tandem and there is no difference between uh, demand and supply. I have spoken a lot in uh, two, three sentences, but, and what we have to understand that there is enough understanding here that energy storage is needed to do a net zero and renewable integration cannot happen without it. It doesn't change for a microgrid, it doesn't change for a big grid. What happens is, is that a microgrid being a smaller one becomes easier to manage. There have been microgrids uh, in certain island islands in Portugal, in Caribbean, which have run on 80% or 90% renewable energy without any uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and we need to have the same on the bigger grids, but that's not going to happen without even long duration energy storage, where we are talking about storage going more than 10 hours, 12 hours, even 100 hours. Essentially, uh, replacing the capacity which otherwise would have been supplied by fossil fuel. And uh, there has been enough, it's a new field, uh, actually long duration concept was launched in COP26. And so, we, so it's a very new awareness that we have to create. And uh, as I said, there was only one person who spoke about it, uh, where it is important that when you want, not only want to store uh, uh, solar or wind, you want to deliver that solar and wind, not for 10 hours or 12 hours. You want to deliver that for 24 hours. India has gone very ahead in terms of round the clock power, but still it does not actually measure that for every hour of generation or consumption, the generation is by renewable energy. And for that, the grid needs to be smart. You need to have measurements, you need to have, uh, and there is a lot of uh, I remember one statement made during the session today, uh, what can be measured can be financed. And the, which conversely means that something that cannot be measured does not get financing. Which means that if we have problems on the grid for which we don't measure, it means that those problems don't exist, but that's not the reality. When we are removing the rotating mass from the grid, uh, we are going to have problems. We are going to have inertia, lack of inertia, lack of reactive power, lack of voltage support. But because these services, spinning reserve, because these services were provided free and are still being provided free of charge because we still have uh, coal power plants and in India and then we do have uh, some gas turbine power plants, that there is no analysis yet done that if this is removed from the grid, will our grid sustain? So a smart grid needs to be sustainable, it needs to be resilient, it needs to have energy security, and it needs to be flexible. So that would be a smart grid. And for that, you need to have different kinds of automation. Thank you. And reacting and uh, operating immediately to the demand of the situation. But when you have microgrids, 
and you are having a national grid all over the country and you also have a move to set the tariff at a central point across the country. How will this complex marriage work? Will you be operating through that trunk grid? Will you be picking up the micro grid supplier at that point of time? Would you be giving a choice to your consumer that this is the cost of power at this point of time if you want? You want to carry on with it or you want to back out? Now, are those choices going to be open in this compounded complex situation? Or do you think the challenges will increase? Because, you, for example, even today I was reading that all imported coal-based power stations have been asked to be on must run for the next few months. Now, can you give that direction to somebody who is on renewable power and he's going to marry into this system? And how sustainable is it? Will the smart meter mean that if you don't shove in your money there, whether online or whatever it is, you are going to be shut off? Ritu, you've been into the system. Okay. So a lot of uh, questions in there. Uh, please, if I forget to answer them, it's, course, it's, it's because I would have forgotten and just remind me and I'll uh, add them on. Okay, so the very first thing is what appears, of course, is it a complex situation already? Yes. You know, one of the reasons we don't have solutions yet is because it is extremely, extremely complex and uh, somehow amazing that we have one national grid. Given the diversity, size, uh, population, everything, by and large, it's a single, by and large, it is a single grid, right? which is a huge achievement. Uh, but there are a lot of disparate, actually not disparate, but they are, because it's following a legacy system, perhaps they are designed to become disparate entities who now need to be connected with each other in decision making. Whether it is, you know, the grid, uh, developer, the grid manager, the generator, uh, the distributor, the RE industry, consumers, right? Uh, the Ministry of Coal, uh, with the EV penetration going up and automobiles using less uh, fossil fuels of like diesel and petrol. Is there a play for petrol and diesel to replace coal in electricity generation? I don't know. You know, that, that is always an option, right? Because there is that much of oil and gas around. And if there is not going to be, and the primary consumption is happening in the automobile segment. Tomorrow, if we have a global scenario of 33% or something, one third of the vehicles being EVs, what happens there? So there are a lot of things which are very dynamic right now. And players which are today taking decisions independently need to take decisions jointly if there is to be an impact. There is also a whole play of IT over here across various parts. So if you look at a smart grid that you were talking about, the smart, you know, uh, what Upma was also talking about here, it needs, apart from everything else, standardization. There are, of course, concerns on security. But it needs everybody to be able to use systems that communicate with each other. Right? Whether is whether it's at the storage site, whether it's at the at the discom DT site, whether it's at you know uh, the SLDC level, uh, wherever it is, right? In software, hardware, all of it needs to be compatible and talk to each other. We talk of scenarios in the smart grid where I have left my EV on smart charge overnight, and this information is plugged in. I plug in at 9 p.m. I need a charged EV by 6 a.m. Should there be around 9.30 or 10 or 1 a.m. a temporary spurt in demand at the grid level, it can cut off my EV. 
So this is what other smart systems can do. You know, it can tell you, it can prioritize. Okay, somebody's EV which is on long charge gets cut off. Somebody who needs an EV to fast charge in the next 30 minutes does not get cut off because this is how the data has been fed in on the charging device. My car which is charged and lying there and connected has a battery which can also become a source of supply into the grid. This is now I'm going very, very granular, but, but at the end of it, it requires this level of granularity if you are able, if you're really talking of a smart network and not just, you know, uh, IT solutions at the large scale level, but nothing that comes down to the distributed at the consumer level. You see, this is precisely what bothers me for any market to operate, there must be a buyer and a seller. When you say the buyer or a seller, it brings with him an option whether to sell or to buy. Will that kind of a freedom be there? Or is it going to be compulsory that you, if you are plugged onto the system, you jolly well have to sell you have to buy, but for that, price has to be determined. In the current scenario, it would be actually unfair on the distribution company, on the utility, to make it an option. Because they are, uh, you know, really, they, they have the hands tied. Mm -hmm. You know, they have no say in the pricing of what they are selling, who they can sell to, how much they can sell to. On top of that, you have uh, consumers reducing the load, the C&I consumers who are really their bread and butter for survival. So there are a lot of dynamics at play which are very frankly not in the interests of distribution companies as things stand. Okay. To now make it optional that you know I don't, I can choose between two or three, hmm. it's yeah, I, I like the idea of competition as a user but if I put myself in the discom shoes, in the current scenario it is not fair to enable this and I think we should enable this. There should be freedom for those utilities to also choose how they operate, who they sell to, etc. That doesn't become a... You see, it's a free market in one sense, but yet it is a very selective market. Whether in our system you can allow that selective market that no, I can only sell to him, he can only send that signal through a price signal. That this is the cost of my product, Take it or leave it. Now, how fast that exchange is going to work, Shivani, would you like to intervene that whether the system is good enough to be able to pick up that signal, decide, and give it an answer back in this complex system like ours, which is, mind you, it is also controlled by a lot of climate ravages. Your transmission line might break down somewhere. What you are seeing in the hilly areas today, it particularly will be relevant to hydro sector. It can be landslides. There can be some other incidents. What is your gut feeling? Thank, thank you for the multiple questions. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> Very good evening to all of you. And I think in one line, if I have to answer, it may be, you know, it will work as the other marriages work. <laughs> So that was on a lighter note, but uh, when we talk of smart grids, it has to be essentially stronger, greener and smarter. Uh, we are talking of open market, which till now has been successful when we talk of large kind of renewable plants. So you would have a large solar park, a wind park, and then how the open access works. Now when we come to these microgrids, which are frankly a low hanging fruit as far as we talk of the Indian scenario, and they would be in small pockets throughout the network. Now, if, you, if we see from the power system application point of view, microgrids is something which has to be very, very application specific. So microgrid essentially is a small setup, say a 2 MBA, 4 MBA transformer. You have various kind of different renewable sources which are near to the load. So when we are implementing a microgrid, it's very important to have the application decided. And when we talk of buy and sell of power, 
Open access, of course, I agree to my uh, all my co-panelists, it's a headache for a distribution utility. If they tell you there are, you know, 100 homes or say 20 microgrids connected and they could inject it at any time. So that's where there are these regulations which are still in the draft stage where, say, for example, in Gujarat, they would say that this is the kilowatt capacity. You cannot export more than 50% into the grid and so on. Now, also understanding that microgrid is very, very apt in terms of community microgrids. So as Rajdanji has correctly said, the climate changes. Microgrid can be a savior for us. We are all seeing climate change that's right there on our face. We are not saying that some storm, some uh, you know, uh, drought or something may happen 10 years later. We are seeing schools going online because of high rain, high pollution, etc. So if there are climate changes, if the transmission grid, there are certain contingencies, microgrid is the one which can save communities. It's very common where, say, substation fires in Australia. So that's where the microgrids are going to disconnect from the grid, but they would still continue to feed the power. Also, we are working a lot into the R&D of grid following, grid forming inverters, which would uh, definitely, you know, when we see our global counterparts, there are a lot of microgrids integrated. We recently did many integration studies for the US market as well. When we come to India, it's very important we understand our, de our demography, the kind of, so it's no more about just having power. It is also about different service levels. Is it a quality power? Is it a safe power? What is the number of interruptions that you see? In case there is a contingency, you are not connected to the grid, how fast the systems operate? What happens to new kind of customer segments like data center which would get connected in parallel and so on? So frankly, it's a low hanging fruit, a very, very careful implementation is required. It is very specific to the application where you would like to say have very rural villages or hospital or parliament or military buildings with a backup of power with the microgrid, and then maybe it will work as the marriages work. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so you see the, I think, uh, Rashika, yes. would you like to react to this situation that even in, in this kind of a situation, can you have total freedom to generate, or will there need to be a system operator who will say no? you cannot generate more than this mm -hmm. or another situation that a consumer is told <coughs> that you cannot consume more than this in view of the system and the generation constraints, so-called uh, a bad word called rationing. Mm -hmm. And there again, you decide on your priorities, not a across the board rationing, say 30%, 25%. It is so and so will not be interrupted, say continuous process industry or an emergency service or IT services, but others will have this cut. So you need a police inspector in any case or the government to come in. What do you visualize? Can it be a free market in that sense? Or you still need to impose your will on who can generate how much and who can consume how much? Thank you so much for the question and good evening everyone. Um, so I would say, I think these things are already happening if you see in the West, right? India is not there yet. So we have to take baby steps to reach there and there's not one solution, right? We need regulatory interventions. We need uh, market uh, mechanisms, right? Like new market designs, uh, so, uh, other business models which needs to be there plus a digital transformation, right? The topic where it would drive uh, that kind of network and integrate more renewables, right? More microgrid, decentralized renewable generation. So it, it has to be three in together and in tandem and uh, like to weave that grid, right? So that we can create an open market where everybody has, there are price signals available at different point in time for each consumers to consume when they want to consume, from whom they want to consume, right? So it has to be a long, it is a long road. It's not like today, right? So where like small microgrids are there, um, uh, where like in that microgrid the decisions are made, but then overall it is integrated to the national grid where the decisions are also like where there are surpluses available, it goes back to the national grid. So those kind of communication channels through smart grid makes, enables that thing. So I think that is like my overall nutshell, like all three things have to be there in place.
to drive where we want to go as an open market mm. with all the uh, regulatory like it's not like okay regulation comes in when there are mm. crisis situation where are emergencies that there mm. and those processes are in place to drive that i think that's a very very intelligent answer and i think uh, we have to find a way out but maybe since this could be the last uh, query which may be open to you would you visualize a situation in our country where before we launch on this very big exercise country wide we test out the principles on some representative sample or region which broadly represents the generation mix of the country and the consumer mix of the country or should we just enter into this thing say jai mata di and you know go ahead do you want me to answer well if you mata sorry i said jai mata di so you have a right to answer <laughs> you take that right from him for a while only please okay ah, thank you mr razdan good evening to everybody this is sunil uh, i think i am coming from uh, energy exemplar which is a leading energy modeling and uh, analytical platform called plexos uh, they are flagship product quite popular in western part of world and uh, we are trying to uh, do lot many things in india as you correctly said mr rajdan can we test how how will it be looks like if we impose that model in india to open market model in india the where uh, the where like two like plexos or any en energy modeling like assumption what kind of assumptions you will take and what kind of thinking and thought process you are taking that if tomorrow indian market will open the how does it impact to the discom how does it impact to the market operator how does it impact to the end consumer so those kind of scenario everything can be built like you can create a complete digital twin when everybody's in panelists is saying that if you can put large battery storage long duration battery storage short duration battery storage your smart grid your micro grid if you can create the those thing in any kind of platform let's say software platform any kind of it platform which can represent the your uh, real life situation emulate the real life situation and what you are saying that if i open the market the how is it impacting the supply side demand side and everything even before implementing you can visualize in the software and see it how is it impacting on the overall uh, system and that kind of technologies i think what rashika is saying are already in use in western part of the world still they are also facing problem as far as the society qc supply demand gap is concerned and india is long way to go at recent regulations come from the resource side because there are a lot of okay micro grid a small grid is a way long thing but even the national grid are we sufficient enough to uh, minimize the supply and gap demand are we doing the proper resource side equity or not so those where such kind of technology really help and visualize those thing and really answer your questions before implementing it and before putting the cost on it and one thing okay everybody is saying we need that much of transmission line that much a smart grid but on what cost are we doing optimally so those uh, software really helps when you take this decision uh, so this is like my See, say uh, yeah. sunil what you and rashika have hinted it is this is happening abroad yeah now i know i think the year was 1999 probably i had gone to canada because we were trying to study what their system is they're a federal country and there was a gentleman in toronto by the name of bud the lawyer and he was trying to invent a system of power supply where you choose i want to pick that flows power that flows power that flows power i tried to follow it for the next 4 5 years but i don't i hope that the whole experiment was not nipped in the bud So Mr. Bud, Mr. Bud's power—I do not know whether it actually happened or not. But a country as diverse and complex as India, and given the scenario of climate extremes that are witnessing, to, we are witnessing today. Do you think we can venture into this kind of a model by borrowing somebody from? XYZ country who's dressed like me 
uh, invent yes. our own but again there's so much uncertainty system as you see the weather condition changing so fast in any case you have to take the decisions you have to supply the power you have to run the show but how optimally you can run the show where these tool and technology can really help like okay if tomorrow sun comes or not tomorrow rains comes or not you have multiple three or four or five scenario you have to run this and see your standard deviations what where the max level you can play what's the min level you can play but you have to take a decision in any ways so where such technology help and and help in your uh, minimizing your cost and maximize your uh, profits and ultimately the the whole objective to serve the consumer at the lowest see, cost see it's a play yeah. of uh, reliability availability affor affordability and stability as well as when i mentioned viability financially viable and at the top of it given our system you have to have an adjudicating process capable of speedy disposal of any complaints against that system and not lie for 5 10 years in the bucket i was just you see yesterday sent a uh uh a uh, post from one of the states where a tribunal was set up four years 1.35 crore salary and other expenses were incurred and the tribe and the tribunal did not pass a single order so i mean that kind of a situation we want something we have an adjudication process we are a democracy very very dynamic democracy and we want things to happen and yet the cart should not turn over because we are a democracy and ultimately people decide and we must realize the political leadership wants stability we may want things to jump suddenly but they want order the people want order so i think it's a it's a very tough call and an even tougher call for this panel because uh, i think mr garg has gone behind the scenes to tell us that we have outlived our utility and overshot our time thank you very much thank you very much ma'am i think i take this occasion to welcome mantri ji who has come here and he is our chief guest and uh, he shall be conferring the awards on all the award winners thank you very much garg saab we are going to vacate this place but we have to honor and just uh, 40 minutes are at our disposal so, still yes sir 40 minutes mantri ji is for, here with us yeah for 40 minutes he is here okay promise, sure enough promise kar ke la Nee, nee, but how long do we want him for the function? Forty minutes only. No, no. But does it include this uh, talking shop that we are running, or uh, we can just cut short? And, uh, By how much? Be frank. You know, you want us a guillotine? We can wicket just yeah, now. Hard to do, sir. Okay. <laughs> no, no. I was. I'm very used to it. I was given an order by the president of India that I must vacate my house as secretary of the to the government of India within 24 hours because he wanted to come in it himself thank you very much sir